So first of all, we have the command. We have the command. Look at verses 1 through 5 with me. Jesus then left that place and went to the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Matthew adds, for any reason at all. Jesus says, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and sent her away. Jesus says, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Okay, so as I mentioned, Matthew chapter 19 um, is the companion passage. It records the same conversation, uh, gives us a few more details. And the question the Pharisees ask is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Okay, that's quite a question, isn't it? Um, now, at the time, this is important to understand, there were two schools of thought on the issue of divorce and remarriage. And one was the school of Hillel, and the other one was the school of Shammai. Okay, And so Hillel was the liberal of the two, and Hillel said that, uh, a man could lawfully divorce his wife for any and every reason. There, there were really no, uh, no meaningful restrictions on, on um, divorce uh, and so forth. And so really, one commentator actually explains it this way. He says, um, a man could divorce his wife for the most trivial of reasons, according to Hillel. Such things as taking down her hair in public, talking to other men, and even burning the bread or putting too much salt in the food. For her to speak ill of her mother-in-law or to be infertile were more than sufficient grounds for divorce, end quote. Uh, so really, if there's just anything a guy didn't like about his wife, he just, he could divorce her. Um, the other school, on the other hand, was uh, Shammai. And Shammai was the conservative school of thought that said, essentially, there were no legitimate reasons for a man to divorce his wife. And so if you place these two schools next to each other, really what you have is you have uh, uh, opposite ends of a spectrum, is what it really seems like. Um, now, these two men, um, their ideas on this matter... Uh, gained followers, and then um, ultimately they became these two prevailing schools of thought among the religious leaders. Now, knowing this helps to put a context in place for the question that the Pharisees are asking Jesus when they say, according to Matthew 19, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? I mean, that was a very Hillelian question right there, where, where they want to know, is he of the school of Hillel or is he of the school of Shammai? They wanted to put him in either one of these schools to see either which one he supported um, and if he was in their camp or, their, or if he was in um, the camp of the other school. Jesus' response, actually, is to point them to Scripture. This is what I love about Jesus, is that Jesus is not going to follow the thoughts of men. Jesus is, is there as a corrective to the thoughts of men to bring the word of God. And so that's what he does here is he says, what does the word of God say? And that's what he's getting at when he says, what did Moses command you? Now, just to kind of give a little bio of Moses, if you're not familiar with him, um, aside from Abraham, Moses was the man. To Jews, he was uh, he was their hall of famer, um, and only Abraham probably outshined Moses in in the mind of any Jew. Moses was the guy that was the leader of the nation of Israel when they were led miraculously out of slavery in Egypt, and Moses led uh, the Israelites for those forty years that they wandered in the desert, and he brought them up to the borders of the promised land himself, not being able to enter. Um, Moses is also the author of the first five books of the Bible. That would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, collectively known to the Jews as the Torah. Okay, And so as the author of those five books, Moses um, and the, the, the Moses' name became synonymous with the law of God, okay, because contained in those five books is the 
is the law that God gave Moses to turn around and give to the Israelites. So whenever you read the law and the prophets or Moses and the prophets, okay, it's talking about that law that Moses gave to the Israelites from God uh, and then the prophets after that came in their writings after him. Uh, or if Jesus says, you know, uh, what did Moses say? He's saying, essentially, what did the law say? And when Jesus says, what did Moses or the law say? Everybody knows that that means what did God say? Now, two applications for us. Number one, Jesus is affirming the divine inspiration and authority of the writings of Moses. Okay? You have from Jesus, as a historical figure, a, 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 a phenomenal historical figure, affirming the divine inspiration and authority of the Jewish scriptures, um, the first five books of, of the Jewish scriptures. This is important for us as Gentiles because we need to consider those books inspired. We need to consider them the word of God. It's very important. If you're a Jew, this is very important for you because you've probably grown up, uh, you've probably grown up being taught that, the, the, that Jesus was a Gentile who started the Catholic religion. And you probably were taught that the New Testament was written by Gentiles as a manual for persecuting Jewish people. And that couldn't be further from the truth. If you were to actually open up the New Testament and read it, you're going to find that it's written by Jews, for Jews, about the most Jewish person that ever lived, Jesus. So very important for you to understand as far as a, a first application that, that Jesus affirmed the writings of Moses as divinely inspired and authoritative, which is why he points them back to Moses. The second application here is this, is that we need to do what Jesus is doing here in our own lives, and that is, is we go to the word of God for the answers and for the instructions for our lives. In other words, we don't live independent and autonomous of what God has revealed in his word, but instead we subject our whole life to the words of God as found in scripture. And, and just, like, just like Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil in the desert, every single temptation he responded by going to the written word of God. We also, when we are tempted, need to go to the written word of God. And just like Jesus in the situation here in Mark chapter 10 was turning to the word of God to answer a question about an issue in life, we need to turn to the word of God to receive instruction and teaching on issues that we face in life. Now, this is important for us because a lot of times we may verbally declare that, yes, the Bible is the word of God, and I believe that it's inspired and it's authoritative, but yet we don't live that way. We, we become very selective about the things we want to follow and the things we don't like, so we'll just ignore. And that's a very inconsistent um, approach to the Christian life, and honestly, it really begins to discredit our integrity as Christians. Okay, If this is the word of God, then everything in it is authoritative over our lives, and our whole life comes underneath uh, its authority and is bound up by the authority in this in the scriptures. So it's very important for us Christians to actually live like the Bible is authoritative by going to it and obeying what it says.